This is Christy Casey Sanders coming to you live from PYM Live New York. Um, we are at the beautiful Ani Berkshire Hotel. Um, and I have with me a panel of uh, really wonderful meeting professionals who I hope you enjoy listening to today. Um, and we're discussing primarily ethics, advocacy, and engagement. Um, the questions that I'm asking today are based off of information that our attendees gave to us when they registered, as well as a PYM Live roundtable that we held with event professionals in New York City last month. Um, so before we start with questions, I would love for my panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Jim, can we start with you since you're sitting since right I'm here? here? Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm Jim Alcon. Uh, I am a marketing consultant. The name of my company is Meetings and Media. I've been in the industry for a long time, uh, a lot of it in, on the publishing side. I was an editor and publisher of many industry publications. I've also worked for an event technology company, a, a small boutique event company. So um, I've been around the block a little bit and seen the industry from a variety of different perspectives. Very cool. Um, Cheryl, introduce yourself for us, would you? Hey, everybody. I'm Cheryl Lawson, a.k.a. Party Aficionado. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, it's great to uh, virtually meet you all. So I, uh, Party Aficionado is my company, events. I do mostly social marketing. I found that um, a lot of my clients back in the in the heyday needed more social media than uh, anything, so I kind of do a little bit of both. And uh, as you can see from my background, I have my own project. It's called Social Media Tulsa, and we do an annual conference. So I get to keep my, my chops. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. And then, Joan, why don't you introduce yourself to our live and virtual audience? Thanks. Good morning. I'm Joan Eisenstadt of Eisenstadt Associates in Washington, D.C. I've been in the industry um, even longer than Jim. <laughs> I'll, I'll put a number. It's been more than 40 years. Um, I've had my own company since 1981, and I um, moved from doing full-service meeting planning to doing consulting, training, and facilitation in the things that are my passions, and those are um, good education at meetings, good engagement, so it's wonderful we're talking about that. Um, ethics is a, a hot button for me. Me and I do a lot of training on that. And then I, I always say that my um my left brain does more of the work on contracts. I also love negotiating contracts, which I know is totally weird, um, but I love language, and so I'm also an expert witness in the industry, and, and um, I'm thrilled to be here. This is fun to do today. Thanks, Christy, for all the help in setting it up. Oh, you're welcome. And, uh, and for those of you in the viewing audience, if you haven't yet been introduced to Google Effects, uh, Joan is something of a master. Usually. Oh yeah, yeah. So wait, let's do that. Yeah, if you're lucky, you might just see her as a cat with a snorkel mask. Um, oh, so. wait, let's try another one. <laughs> but that's not the one I like, although it's pretty fun. <laughs> so um, you know, part of the reason why I really uh, love what Joan brings to the table in terms of education is because one of her core messages is that when you're doing business. It doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be dull. You can be having a lot of fun. Um, I'm Christy Casey Sanders. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, I am the VP of Creative for Plan Your Meetings. Um, so basically, I'm in charge of uh, education, content, and experiences, whether it is um, the educational information that we are putting out on digital channels, whether it's our social networks, uh, whether it is uh, our live event experiences. So. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us because I know that you have a lot of different choices and, and ways that you could be spending your time. And so it is a, a great, great honor. Um, so I want to get into the questions. The first one is, you know, over the past couple of years, first there was kind of the AIG scandal. Um, more recently, we've had the GSA scandal, you know, the $80 muffin, those kind of things. And I'm wondering, um, you know, it's thrust our profession in the spotlight. Uh, in primarily negative ways, and I'm wondering how has that helped or hurt us? And Jim, do you want to start? Sure, on that? sure. You know, with all the technology and everything you've been setting up, I forgot that we were even talking about anything <laughs> today. So, so let, let me just think about what you just said. No, I actually, I guess whenever the word scandal is associated with your industry, that's probably not a good thing. You know, but but I, I would raise the question. You know, with with GSA and AIG. You know, are we really talking about scandal in the meetings industry? Is this really the is this our industry? You know, I, I mean, it's more corporate America or the government. Think about it. There's a difference between being a meeting professional and a meetings attendee, right? I, I mean, 
and, and, and you just have to sort of put that in perspective because I, I think, I think I, I, obviously anybody who's a meeting professional thinks that these scandals, you know, it's unfair to classify a whole industry as being frivolous and, and, and you know, irresponsible and things like that. Um, however, however, even with that being the case, uh, it does create a perception and it does link it back to the meetings industry and the perception has been uh, that, gee, is this a serious industry or is this just kind of a, a bunch of party people that go out and take advantage of being out of town on the road and with a bunch of their colleagues? Uh, I, I think, you know, maybe never so much in recent times has this been exposed as a column written, I don't know if familiar with it, maybe, I don't know, six months ago, five months ago in the Wall Street Journal by a columnist named Holly Finn who literally attacked the industry and, and just called it irresponsible and pointed to GSA um, and, and really had kind of a fun time making fun of us. You know, so, so what, does, what does that tell us? Um, you know, she was very, very critical of the, the GSA scandal. She also happened to mention that since that time the government has done about 750 government held events. So why would the government do so many events knowing that the spotlight is on them? It just maybe, just maybe they thought there was a good reason for holding the events, so then there was value to it. So she kind of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, combated her own argument. But nonetheless, what it does, and what I think it did, was sort of uh, provide a wake-up call to us, because I think we're very good about talking amongst ourselves, like we're doing right now, and, and talking about our value and what we do and how we do it and why it's so important. But this was a call to action to say maybe we're not so great at communicating to the outside world. Now, does the outside world really need to know? Um, in some circles, yes, it would help. But there are certain legislators that are passing legislation or trying to push through uh, different different uh, legislation that might have an effect on travel, travel restrictions, or just how people meet, then maybe that's something we want to get involved with. Uh, there's a, an organization that just created recently um, called the Meetings Industry Advocacy Hub. I've got that right. Wow, so how is that different from Keep America Meeting and some of the other... It, it, it's more of the same. Okay. Okay. Keep America Meeting has been going on for a long time. USTA, U.S. Travel Association, has been a firm advocate. This is a, 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 a partnership between the Convention Industry Council and um, Roger Rickert's organization, which is, uh, I think, Voices in Advocacy. But what they're trying to do is gather people and then sort of, sort of be kind of like a, an advocacy hotline. And it's primarily focused on legislative issues. You know, so, so you know, one issue that, that always bothered me, because I've heard all the advocacy, you know, pitch and everything, and, and I'm in the industry, I've been in the industry for a while, so naturally I'm, I'm concerned with it. Um, but, you know, what can individual meeting professionals do, whether you're a supplier, especially if you're a meeting planner, it's not so much, uh, you know, running around Washington with placards and protesting and, <laughs> and, and, and contacting your Congress people. Is she disagreeing with me already? No, no. no but I actually, I did, I did okay. want to, I did, I'm glad that you were going there because yeah. what I wanted to do is, you know, I, I, mean, I, I think it's important to have government, you know, people, yeah. people advocating for us on, on the national level and having some kind of unified voice because we haven't really, I mean, it took, you know, 50 years for the Convention Industry Council to come up with standards. Like, right. It, it, so, so I do feel like we're, a, we're part of a very disjointed industry. You know, we have people who do special events, we have people who do corporate events, we have people who do trainings, we have people who do all, and, and they don't, there's not a lot of, you know, places where they can kind of come together common ground wise. Uh, and a lot of times, especially if they're administratives in the middle of a corporation, they, they're even more isolated. So I wanted to get down to that personal level of, and Joan, maybe you have some ideas on this, things that everybody in this room can be doing so that when we are, putting meetings together, when we're designing them, when we're on site tours, when we are, you know, faced with, you know, whether or not we accept that iPad, things that we can be doing to push the industry forward so that we are very transparent and we are very ethical and we are very, um, you know, focused on, on the strategy and the business objectives. Um, thanks. And Jim, I wasn't disagreeing. What I was doing was laughing um, about the placards. I'm, I'm getting mine ready for this weekend for the anniversary uh -huh. march um, on Washington. So um, they're, a little, they're a little different, but they're, um, they're still the idea. And since I live in D.C., um, right across from the FBI, I, I always feel like putting up signs to, uh, to them and um, to the Federal Election Commission next door that we really are a good profession. Um, let me make a couple of comments on what you said. And I think also for those listening, um, 
that, first of all, let me go back to the Convention Industry Council, and I think, Christy, thanks for mentioning how old it is, and um, it's been around since 19, in the 1940s, um, and that they did finally put standards together. I served on the CIC, what was then the CLC, Convention Liaison Council Board in the early 90s for MPI, and, and we talked then about all these issues, and so what I think is different, and I think, Jim, um, you brought all this up, um, and Christy, you as well, that we're getting the media spotlight because of um, because of practices that I think are, are common in the industry and that is having very showy meetings with a lot of alcohol, a lot of food, none of which is necessarily bad and at the same time if you're looking at it from the outside and one of the, um, as a side note to that, one of the things I think that we can do and that um, that publications can do is when they show people at our industry meetings, don't show them all at receptions with drinks in their hands, show them in sessions. Um, I'm very aware of the image that we have um, because of AIG, because of the GSA meetings, and and because of a lot of the other things. I think that it's very easy to find, I mean, travel agents for years had the image of being people who came um, with plastic bags in their bags and took the shrimp off the table. Um, and, and this is the image we have. And I think that what we can do, there are a number of things. First of all, if you hear, so, hear something, say something. Um, if you see an article that's negative, write, the letter, uh, write a letter to the editor of your paper, write a letter um, online, write a letter to Brian Williams or other newscasters. Um, I did all of those. I said, here's what we really do. Um, and yes, these were things that might not have been great, but we don't know that. We did didn't see the budget, um, for instance, for the for the GSA meeting, and, and I think that some of the things they did in reading the the um, the, um, the IG report was um, was stupid, frankly, and unethical, and uh, against government regulations as well as against what our industry does. So we can write letters, we can go out and pick it during um, the hearings on Capitol Hill for uh, the GSA meetings. Um, I kept getting emails and, and comments online for people who said, just could you run up to the hill, Joni, and, um, and go and run into the hearing and say something. I think that what the CIC is doing with advocacy will be good as long as we all participate. It, can only, it can't be an organization, it can't be an individual. It has to be all of us understanding the industry, understanding what can be and should be and how we can speak out. Um, in D.C., I have a non-voting representative in Congress, um, my little plug for getting rights for us. The rest of the people listening um, no doubt have a voting representative um, in Congress, three in fact, their own um, member of Congress and then their two senators. And then they have the people in their state legislatures. Um, this stuff is hurting us. I've seen clients' meetings um, decline in attendance because government participants can't be there. Uh, and Jim, there were government meetings, there are government meetings, and we're seeing a huge number, not only of meetings being canceled, we're seeing um, people who can't attend. I saw an article recently uh, from some NSA, um, NASA, sorry, NASA scientists, um, NSA is on my mind, um, NASA scientists who said that they cannot, US, um, U.S. scientists with NASA who cannot attend international um, meetings, which is going to hurt us, it's going to hurt the scientific community um, because they can't attend. So we can be aware of the issues, be smart about them, understand what we're talking about, and go speak out. Um, has this affected the way anybody in this room has had to work or the conversations that you've been having with your key meeting stakeholders? Has it changed the way that you put your meetings together? Like, do you find yourself, you know, looking at a reception differently or has this affected anyone personally? Okay, if there's anybody in the virtual audience uh, that has a story to share, feel free to do that as well. Um, there are a couple different ways that you can interact with us. Uh, if you click through to view the video, you can comment on the video and we'll see that as a real-time question that we can then address. Um, if you're in the room, you can always uh, raise your hand or uh, if you're shy, you can tweet using Yay PYM. So if you're uh, listening to this just audio, you can tweet Yay PYM. Can I just oh yeah, there's a, I think. I'll give you the mic. He's got a mic. Got it. Okay, cool. You can I just add an advocacy, Ab advocacy point? Um, you know, the, the work going on by CIC and, and um, USTA and Keep America Meeting, 
that's kind of a big picture, you know, look at the industry. Um, I, what, what the conversations that I hear a lot is, you know, what can I as an individual do to help advocate the industry? And, you know, what I, my recommendation is advocate for yourself within your organization if you're a professional planner. I mean, really, try and elevate your role. And when we're doing that on a, you know, on a regional, local, uh, national level, then suddenly that elevates the whole industry. And what do I mean by, you know, advocate for yourself? Well, try to get involved. Try to have as much dialogue as you can with executives within your company. I mean, meeting planners can be thought of as, you know, logistics and design experts, which is lovely. Or they can also be thought of as strategists. And or party planners. And there's but, nothing but, wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being yeah, a party but, or a wedding planner. It is part of our industry. But I think yeah. it's, Jim, you're right about the perception piece. You know, I, I mean, if you can be thought of as a strategist that understands your co corporate objectives and are an active participant in that, your value internally will increase and that will also be recognized and others will, you know, will, will see that. And if that can happen really at a grassroots level, I think that elevates the entire industry. Suddenly, your company will understand and another company will understand and, and I think that's really you know a, a, what individuals can do and what I would recommend yeah I would, which I isn't would easy by the way what Jim just said um, my, my thoughts are I agree with you completely especially if, as people are searching for these topics online um, you know if somebody's searching AIG or the, you, know, the, you know meeting planning scandal you know your voice should also show up in those search results your point of view I mean, if I'm searching for most topics, I can I can guarantee you I'm going to see Joan's point of view on it, and I can probably see Christy's point of view on it, and that helps the industry. If you know, if I Google a topic, um, I want to see your voice. I want to see what you think about uh, this particular topic. So you know, agree, completely agree. Get your um, point of view in front of and, and being a part of the the conversation. And, 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 Oh, let me just add quickly to that because this is sort of this is hard for us because we're. Um, but I think Cheryl, um, with what you're doing, it's also the um, with social media. If we can, I think people tend to follow on Twitter um, people um, in their industry. I follow a lot of people, including a lot of news people. And if I've got something that I want to direct to them um, about our industry or anything else, you can use a lot of hashtags. You can send things. You can be active. And the opportunities today are so great compared to when I first got in this industry that to me there's almost no reason that we're not being visible and advocating both as Jim said for ourselves with our uh, in our organizations with clients um, in our communities and and I think online sorry Jim didn't mean to interrupt you no that, that, that's okay but but you know it, to, just to, to bang home the point of how much work we have to do as an industry. The day after this Wall Street Journal article came out, and it was somewhat critical of, of the Convention Industry Council, um, the CEO of the Convention Industry Council, Karen Katowski, wrote a letter to the Wall Street Journal, which they chose not to run. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it, it, we're, we're so, there's such a disconnect. Now, in a way, that was a good thing because we thought, all right, so let's let's let everybody know that the Wall Street Journal did not run this letter and by the way here is the rebuttal to everything they said and we use social media you know to Cheryl's right. point to yeah. really spread the word as best we could without the Wall Street Journal running it. Wait, correct me if I'm wrong but I believe it was a couple of days after that that you and I and Keith Johnston and right. somebody else joined us and we did a Google Hangout on air so on the youtube.com slash plan your meetings channel, you can find that on-air discussion about how to prove your, your, your value and your ROI as a, as a meeting professional. And, and, and then tweet it. Tweet it again. It's not, it's not a dead discussion, so you can yeah. put that back up. Well, what's funny is that one of the first presentations that I started doing at MPI and SGMP events and things like that was prove your worth as a meeting planner or prove your worth as a meeting professional. And, and so I think that there are some very... Um, basic, very strategic things that everybody in this room can be doing to help raise your profile internally. And those are, you know, primarily start with what the goals are for the meeting. Always make sure that every element of your event design, even if it is, you know, a big flashy party, is aligned to some kind of strategic objective. So that way, if somebody points a finger at that line item and says, well, you know, why did you spend X on this? You can say, because it achieved this. You know, and we have a track record of we know that if we do this this way, these are the results we get. And be very strategic about tracking whether or not you were successful in achieving those objectives. 
Um, educate yourself about how much business, how much revenue is generated as a result of the events that you are planning because there is nothing that is a more effective marketing channel. There's nothing that helps people close business. There's nothing that helps you know, change behavior and thoughts and ideas better than meetings. Um, you know, specifically face-to-face -face meetings, but also, you know, virtual meetings, hybrid meetings. And you are at the crux. You have the power to create transformative experiences. And so sometimes it might just be an internal mental adjustment to understand how important you are to the organization and how much you bring to the table. And then, you know, conducting yourself in a very transparent way. Um, so I want to get into some of the ethical questions in the industry, and I also just want to remind people, you know, at any time, if you have a personal experience, if you have something you'd like to share, if you have a question that this brings up, even if you're on the supply side and you're, you know, well, you know, it affected our property this way, or this is what we do, or feel free to, to share that with us. And if you're watching virtually, feel free to tweet questions, uh, tag them yay PYM, um, or, uh, you can also comment on the video stream for the YouTube video, and we'll see those as well. Um, so what are some other ethical challenges that we have right now? What are some things that are kind of keeping us from moving the industry forward? Um, if you're asking me, I would say it's it's everything. And, you know, it, somebody <laughs> asked me recently, um, she said, why has this been such a, a hot button for you? And pretty much all, all my life, not just as in the profession, um, it's ethics has always been... Um, and behaving ethically and fairly has been part of my life, um, and and I and I I won't go into all the things I said. I don't know that it's important here. I think that the issue is that our industry, um, like many, struggles with how best to do business, and and it, we incentivize. Um, a lot of planners to book meetings um, by giving them stuff, um, offering them stuff, offering them hundreds of thousands of, of hotel points that they can use for vacation. Um, stop by my booth at a trade show and you know possibly win an iPad um, or any any prize. Um, I think that what's happened is that we have. Um, We've gone along doing business the same way forever, and it's been questioned. I remember um, the very first interview I did with an industry publication was 1983. Um, it was not um, the one you were with, Jim. It was um, <laughs> another one, and I'm still friends with the writer um, all these many years later, and it was about ethics, and and I went, periodically I'll go back to read it, and what's interesting is nothing's changed. Um, the items that are being offered are different. So what we have to look at, and I think, you know, Christy, as you talked about the goals for a meeting, I think that we as individual planners have to go back and look at what are our ethics policies in our organization. If we don't have them, then let's write some and make them specific to the meetings department. Um, if people are members of ASAE, MPI, um, PCMA, SGMP, IAE, any of the CIC member organizations, they have agreed by uh, virtue of being a member to abide by a code of ethics. Now, interestingly, um, I think IAEE and SGMP um, both are, um, people can be found um, unethical and stripped of their membership and other things. Um, I do know that if you are a CMP, um, a certified meeting professional, the CIC and the CMP do have a code of ethics and you can, um, someone can report unethical behavior and there is a hearing process. And yes, you can be stripped of your CMP. Um, I think that this goes as well to the supplier side, to our business partners who are offering things. Um, and so the, the argument has been for so many years, well, so-and-so is doing it, so I have to. Nobody will stop by my booth if I don't offer something equal to what others are doing. Um, and I think that if we're buying, um, we planners are buying for our companies, our associations, our clients, based on what we're getting, then we've got the biggest problem there. And if we're being offered stuff, we don't have to take it. Um, I was at a, um, um, an MPI chapter meeting, our chapter Potomac, um, last week, and it was a small meeting, and it was um, there was a drawing, and I knew it was for um, small prizes, small as in under twenty-five dollars, um, and my policy and practice is I enter no drawings. Period. Um, there are things I would like. There are things I could use. There are things that I could give to others. Um, but it's not appropriate. I'm there on behalf 
often of my clients and I know their ethics policies. I've agreed in my contracts to abide by those and I think that we have to, um, as an industry, enforce these and talk about them and have the conversation that says, um, this is what we will do. I um, just completed my last year on ASAE's ethics committee. Um, I was uh, moved up through the ranks to chair and in that process we wrote a new code of ethics for ASAE that's inclusive of all members. And I think that if people are not familiar with the codes that are out there, they need to read them. Um, I'm glad to send, and, and we can talk, Christy, about where we can publish these. I've got lots of resources about how to write um, a code of ethics and examples of others, including those on social media, um, because a lot of associations have found they have to do that. Well, that, I, I would really appreciate that. That would be cool. <coughs> I, I want to ask, just like a quick show of hands, who here works at a company where there is a stated code of ethics? One, two, okay, cool, it's three. So, I mean, that's something that we can also aspire to, too, I mean, and, and on a very grassroots level. Um, because the, you know, the more transparent that is, the less vulnerable you leave yourself off to attacks from the media or uninformed points of view. And, um, and I, let, me, let me quickly add to that, and losing your job. Um, in the last five years, two clients have fired their directors of meetings, both of whom were CMPs, um, for um, ethical policy violations. And so what I would suggest is that employers, um, no matter where their money comes from, if it's members, if it's from um, uh, dues, no matter what it is, um, especially, I guess, if they, are, uh, they have government money, um, they have to be very careful about who's doing what. And so I think that um, it's it's a big it's a very big issue, and I think going back to the very beginning of this, and when Jim talked about the scandals, um, I remember the and uh, the meeting planner for AIG, who was was put on the, no I'm sorry not for AIG for um, Tyco, who was put on the stand when her boss was indicted, um, and she was asked about the birthday party she planned for the boss's wife on company time, being paid by the company, but doing something personal. So I think we've got to be very careful um, about on how we look in, in, in our lives, in our companies, and in the media. I agree. Um, I'd like to now shift um, the conversation a little bit because we've been talking a lot about uh, some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, and, and I'd like to bring Cheryl a little bit more into the conversation as we talk about opportunities. Um, I think that there are a lot of really interesting ways that technology is enabling us to um, you know, do our work more efficiently to create more engaging experiences to save time and money and da da da. And so, Cheryl, I'd love for you, um, you know, because my introduction to you was, oh, she's the meeting planner that goes to CES every year. And so, I want to hear from you. What are some of the technologies that you're seeing, um, and things that are kind of blowing your mind that you're enjoying right now, and that you'd like to to let us know about? Okay. So here's here's my uh, geek out time. Is that what? <laughs> Yeah, the geek out with Cheryl. I need to do that as a segment. But um, I, you know, for those of you who have seen people wearing the Google Glass, um, I really think that that's going to to revolutionize how we do meetings and how we do our jobs and live our lives. Right now, the price point is at, at a place where I don't think we're talking masses. But you know, think about this particular conference meeting session if you were wearing Google Glass and you could stand anywhere in the room and not just at the front of the room. You could walk around and I could see the audience. And so I think that's one thing that we can look forward to. There is a rumor that um, Google is buying, is buying up space in Best Buys across the, the country. And the rumor is that it, it will be a retail space for Google Glass because that's something you have to try on and be fitted for. If you also wear glasses, you've got to have that deal. So look for that. One thing that I think um, is going to change what we're doing right now is this little thing here. What is that? It, this is um, Chromecast oh. by Google. And it is. It is the most magical device I think I've seen come out in a long time. It's a really small um, HDMI porter, portal that allows you to broadcast from your tablet, your phone, your PC or computer, laptop 
to a screen. So I plug the Chromecast into my television or whatever has a uh, HDMI, and I can broadcast whatever is on my computer. I can play YouTube videos. <laughs> I can watch uh, stream live, and it doesn't use your phone. So right now, a lot of streamers, and if you want to send something from your uh, device to a screen or to another, um, a, another, a second screen or a third screen, you're using the Wi-Fi or you're using the power from your phone or from your tablet. What what the Chromecast allows you to do is it uses the Wi-Fi, so it streams. So once you're connected to, hey, I want to show this YouTube video to everybody in the room, it no longer is, is showing on your tablet. So now I can also go somewhere else. I can look at something else while I'm while everybody's watching the YouTube video because it streams via the Wi-Fi and not from your directly from your device. It's it's magical. It's hard to explain. And the best part is it's thirty-five bucks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you can stop looking at all those Pico projectors at uh, at uh, Brookstone now. <laughs> exactly. So you know, uh, you know, for smaller meetings or meetings where you're using. Um, the you know the big flat screen TVs that are you know that have US that uh, have HDMI portals, um, yeah, it's going to be a no brainer. The the only issue I've seen is if you're switching Wi-Fi, it's not so. I have one here at home, and I took it to another location, and switching it from my home Wi-Fi to the venue Wi-Fi was more cumbersome than I thought it would be, so it takes a little bit of time. But I definitely think that's going to change um, how we connect. And, and it's wirelessly, and it's something that you can do uh, with your mobile device. So those are the two kind of really geeky things that I think uh, will affect us. Cheryl, may I ask you a question, um, and really maybe to you and Jim. Um, I'm curious about a number of things about the technology. We're seeing. Um, we're seeing so many issues, and, and some of what the industry's talked about for a long time are um, is the issue of carbon um, and the carbon use by flying. And everybody, we've been through this so much that we're all going to have virtual meetings. We're never going to meet face to face. Blah blah blah. And so I went through this in the 80s. I went through it in the 90s. We keep doing it. So on the one side, there is the issue of the environment and people saying we shouldn't be traveling. On the other side, Jim, is the issue that um, we're all saying the industry has to come back. We've got to do face to face. Um, We've got all these cool technologies. Where are they going to blend? And where will we, as an industry, I guess maybe, Jim, that's yours, and Cheryl, yours is the, the blending. Um, where is the industry going to land, um, so to speak, with, um, with the environment and carbon um, use and virtual versus face-to-face? -face? Can I respond to that? Yeah. Actually? Sure. Um, because I, I feel like it's already blending. I mean, if you have people at your meeting who are using Twitter, you already have a hybrid element to your meeting. Right. I mean, so we already have communities that exist outside of our face-to-face -face audience. So I think that it's not that virtual displaces face-to-face. -face. I think that we have more blended experiences. And I think that, um, I, I think that you know, in terms of the environment and, and the awareness, uh, you know, some of that is going to have to be kind of forced upon us. Um, but in the meantime, you know, hybrid meetings like this, being able to do the education where some people are here and some people are virtual, and we have, you know, uh, you know, six people who are hanging out watching us right now from the airport or from the office or whatever, and then we've got you know 20 people in room. I think, uh, you know, it's it's a tool. You know, it's a tool, and if you're trying to achieve something, it's another option to you can put into your toolkit. So, you know, there was a planner tech last week. It's a very, uh, you know, forward-thinking event, and they didn't live stream it this year, and they had very specific reasons for not doing that. Um, there have been event camps where the first day the focus is on connections and community, so they didn't have any virtual elements to it at all. They broadcast everything on the second day to allow people into that. So I, I think that, you know, it's up to us to identify what the opportunities are to connect with people and to kind of selectively 
you know, decide when we want to incorporate those virtual audiences into the face-to-face the -face and when it's appropriate to just kind of do things virtually. I, I would just, one, one tweak to what you said, I don't know that it's up to us as much as it is up to the event attendees to kind of guide the planners as to what they want and what they don't want, you know? I mean, I, I, think, I think there's so much technology out there, and, and you know, I was going to ask this room whether, whether, whether you people think you're in sort of the, the upper third of, of understanding and being comfortable and knowledgeable about technology, the middle third or the lower third, you know? So let's do a quick straw poll. You know, raise your hand if you think that you are, you know everything about technology, you are like in the top tier of, of your professional like understanding it. Okay, nobody okay. for a virtual, <laughs> virtual audience. Nobody yeah, you, is. You, you want to know something? You, you well, Cheryl, Cheryl feels that way. Even yeah, if and you I don't. Up this room, a third of this room is probably in the upper echelon of this little domain that we're talking well, about, probably. but they don't even realize it. Yeah. You know? Because so, the thing is, that there's so much stuff out there that you don't need at all. You have to sort of pick and choose. Let's let's just talk about Twitter for a second, okay? I was at an MPI event, I don't know, a year ago, where the speaker was speaking, and there was a giant screen about this size. Um, of the Twitter feed coming in on the discussion. And I tweeted, I said, is this screen to the left of the speaker helpful or, or, or harmful to this presentation? It's kind of distracting me. You know, I mean, it's distracting because I'm looking, I'm trying to, I'm following, oh, there's so-and-so making a comment, I'm, I'm losing sight of, of what the speaker is saying. Yet, uh, it was incorporated and people were tweeting. Again, you can't um, control the quality of the tweets. You know, some of them might have been a waste of time. Some of them might have been insightful. Well, if they had paid for a, a tech moderator, they could have controlled the quality of the tweets and well, let the audience Well, there you go. Okay. I, I have my own. And you don't happen to know anybody that would do that. Do I, I know yeah. a lot of people okay, who would do that. Okay. So. I have my own but, thoughts about having the Twitter feed behind the speaker. I, you know, I, one, I think that's just completely distracting and um, and not necessarily a happy <laughs> Um, so those of you who are wondering what just happened, that was my little um, Joan has started playing with the Google effects. So you <laughs> but I'm so glad to hear that. As the, as the social media person here, I think that's completely distracting. It adds no value. Um, one thing I, I tend to do is when there's breaks, when you want to show people what's happening, then you can put the Twitter feed on the screen uh, to show people, hey, here's what else is happening. I think using apps like like Topi and other apps that can people you know they're already kind of on their screen anyway. Give them their own personal ways to connect with people. Um, have the Twitter feed out in the lobby or out in a place where people are gathering and and being social. Yeah. So the technology, while it's great and it allows your audience to spread. It, it's not necessarily, oh, well, we have a Twitter wall, you know, giant Twitter wall. It's, you know, that's, that's, that doesn't add the value. So you really have to think about, what, you know, just like what's the purpose of this meeting, you have to have a social media strategy. How, what are we doing? How are we, um, how are we incorporating social and virtual into our meeting? Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, YouTube Live. You talked about live streaming. And just recently, YouTube has lowered the number of subscribers that, that your channel needs to have in order to use YouTube Live. So it's, it used to be 1,000, and now it's only 100. So more and more people are going to be streaming uh, live on their YouTube channels, and, you know, and rightfully so. I think it's a great way to do it, and it's, and it's affordable, uh, even if you have a business account. So yes, ma'am. I have a... I have a Really I, interesting question from the audience. Go ahead. Uh, Bern Rexer uh, says, you know, he's he's on the supply side. He provides event engagement services. Um, he was wondering about whether or not we need to be requiring now that we're, you know, everybody is kind of, um, you know, capturing content on site and posting it to Instagram and taking the videos and, the, you know, how how do we need to have every attendee sign a consent form? Do we need to just post things in a public space? I mean, I know that when you guys all checked in, you probably saw there was a little sign that said, just so you know, we may be taking pictures and capturing video and audio, and this might show up in promotional materials later, so that you're, you know, and if you want to opt out, let us know. Um, so, so it brings up Absolutely. some ethical issues, you know, should we, I mean, is it, is it, are people taking the risk now that anytime they step out in public, yeah. they can Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, and yes, yes. I'll and wait yes. at the FBI for you. 
<laughs> to all of those things, the answer is yes. But uh, one way to handle it is, um, you know, most of us are using some sort of online registration tool. Um, having a checkbox that people can say, you know, I've read the rules and tell them that they're going to be photographed and give them a way. And don't make the way to opt out yeah. the most ridiculous thing ever. I've seen, like, you know, you have to send a picture of yourself and mail it to and FedEx and you have return receipt. Don't make the opt out of, you know, having your picture taken or using your likeness uh, so difficult that. Uh, that it, it that it's just re, you know unnecessary. It's almost like using the unsubscribe on an email. Give the person an email address. Hey, if you don't want to be a part of the pictures, yeah, email me and we'll make sure that you know we don't use your likeness or that we get your permission to to use a photo uh, of you in our content. And then, like you said, once if you're going to be streaming live, you need to have posted signs and placards that say that you're live streaming and that there's taping going on. Um, it's hard to hide that you're <laughs> streaming, especially if you're using the big cameras, but signage or a part of your mobile app uh, always works. Th to answer Joan's question uh, earlier, too, I think um, going paperless <laughs> is one way uh, that we're all going to have to struggle with. I know Joe's like, no. No. If there, were a boo, if there were a boo little sound, but I can't find one, I would do a boo sound. Oh, uh, well, I think there is, actually. There is? Which is the boo sound? Um, <laughs> is that the, no, that's a cricket. So we well, don't, so for a social media Tulsa conference, we do not do paper. Uh, no handouts, no nothing. Everything is mobile. Uh, and one, because it's a social media specific conference. Uh, but what I do do is I provide uh, the presentations for everybody electronically. Um, the videos, if, we're, if a session is videotaped, it's provided electronically. And everybody gets access to uh, what, I, what I like to call as a, a resource center afterwards using one of the tools uh, I like either Dropbox or Box.net. Uh, it's called a Bloggers Resource Center, but it really is a place where the attendees can go anytime before, during, or after the event to find the content. So whether it's the slide share presentation or it's photos of the speakers, if you're one, because I think people need to create content from their experience when they go to the event. And two, so that you can go back and refer to afterwards, right? So we yeah, have no I think, that's, I think you bring up a really important point, which is you you can't just assume that everyone's got a phone that does more than just answer phone calls. I mean, there are a lot of people who you know may not have been able to download Toby, and so how are you going to provide for those materials and those experiences so they don't feel like they're excluded? How do you um, you know for the people who who just aren't comfortable uh, looking at a digital program? How are you making allowances for, for, for their user experience and for you making sure that they have things they can hold in their hands because they, they need it and they just prefer and Christine, it? Let me, let me make another point. And, and Cheryl, I, I don't know enough about this law and I don't know what you know. And one of the things that I'm very aware of are issues of disability rights. And the, the amendment to the Americans with Disabilities Act is very specific about use of media and use of um, programs online and having them captioned. Um, and I was uh, I saw something recently and I was very surprised that they that the organization had not they were presenting at the SGMP meeting and they had not provided um, any kind of captioning on it and so I, I don't know how that's going to impact even like a program like this um, if you cannot hear you can't you have no idea what we're saying um, and so I think that um, it's going to be another area that we have to look closely at again you know with the paper no paper um, access to um, to various electronic devices, um, what we use, who our audience is, and, and really how we're going to incorporate everybody. Mm -hmm. So are, are, when you are planning meetings, are you seeing your attendees different, um, like generationally different, at different abilities? Are you thinking about that as part of your design <coughs> process? So, um, are you Notice also... It. Notice again. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's not just generational. It's This is about people with disabilities. So generational, yes, and people with specific disabilities who need by the ADA to be accommodated for a live broadcast. Right. Well, and also, too, I mean, 
that is, yeah, I mean, if, if, yeah, there are services that do the closed captioning, so how do you integrate that? Definitely. I think one thing that a lot of meeting professionals aren't aware of is that um, food allergies now are protected under the disabilities, so if you have a meeting and somebody is, you know, has a gluten allergy, they have celiac, and you don't provide for that, you are li leaving yourself liable to, to being sued for discriminating against them and not providing food. Well, and another another way to do, and a lot of what I'm seeing with some groups is that they're doing the, um, and Cheryl, correct me on the terminology, I'm going to call it screen and screen. It's having um, a little somebody down in the corner who's signing, um, and so that, that is another option for having um, a broadcast um, available to people who um, who don't hear um, or and, and we've got to make those accommodations or we're going to exclude a lot of people from meetings. That's a brilliant point. I, I wanted to bring, we have a, oh, hold on, let's hold that thought for just a second because we do have somebody in the room who's going to share something with us. <laughs> so I don't make sure you can't see her, but I can. I'm like, hi, I'm so glad. Yeah. A couple of issues here. There is a generational thing, especially with the tweets. You know, if you look around a room with people under a certain age, they're always on their phones tweeting. So I don't think I think that is a generational thing. But about disabilities, my company does a couple of meetings a year for uh, a not-for-profit that does meetings about recognizing disabilities internationally and about a third of the attendees have a disability. There are several in wheelchairs of all types. Some are blind. Some are also not blind yet, fortunately. Some are also uh, hearing impaired. So we have signing. We have to set up the room appropriately to allow for the wheelchairs so that the wheelchair people feel that they are enabled and that other people don't feel that they're being blocked. I mean, it's, it's quite a thing. And uh, we also have, I think it's called CART, so that we have yes. uh, closed captioning uh, included, because we also uh, live stream that event, because it's a global event. So there's a lot of issues and a lot of planning involved, but you do have to address all these needs, even if it's for just one person. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that that's something Yay! <laughs> it's the only way I can show enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you very much for that, Pat. I, I do. I do think it comes down to you know people say that people are coming and they're just not engaging the way that you want them to engage. I think it comes down to how are you welcoming them? How are you taking into the, like how are you walking the floor and and putting yourself in the in the shoes of the, of the person who has to be uh, in a chair? Are the aisles wide enough? Can they get from place to place? The person who might have uh, difficulty hearing, is your, did you skimp on the AV? Are they going to be stuck with this like fuzzy noise? I, I think that you have, to, you have to get savvier about planning experiences that are inclusive for even if it's just one person, that one person can make a huge difference. Oh, and can I, just as a, this is a technology note and goes a little, slightly into Cheryl's territory, but it's not social media. Um, they were having a big discussion in one of the groups on Facebook about um, a tool, a Google tool called Podio, which knocked my socks off. Um, I have, um, there's a colleague who's using it, and he's been talking about it. And so I think in terms of technology, and, and, and I mentioned him because he also signs, and he's very familiar with CART and all the other services. His name's David Wagner. so. If if you're poor David, I've just given him new friends. Um, so if you're on Facebook, um, he's active in an industry friends group, and you can certainly ask one of us to bring you into that group um, to to hear him. But he um, he does a meeting for people who are deaf and people who are interpreters. Um, he does sign, and he also knows card. He knows everything you need to do. He's a fabulous resource. That's awesome. And I, uh, if you uh, could tweet that, or after you get his permission. Yep. To yep. share his information with us. Yes, so, <laughs> well, yeah, I will. Like, yeah, oh, I just contact this person. Just put yeah, it out I there. I don't want to do that. Yeah, that would be a bombarded yeah. <laughs> Facebook request. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I did. I did want to let you guys know some some feedback we had uh, on Twitter. Uh, Cheryl, to your comment that you felt like the the Twitter feeds were distracting. Uh, Liz King took some issue with you and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Lisa also agreed, but I think that you know it does come down to like I when I've seen it most successfully done is when the presenter is actually incorporating that in some right. way. 
right. or I mean, when it's happening during the breaks. I think it, I think it always has its place. But right. I think if, it, if you have somebody who has a PowerPoint and then you have a Twitter stream behind them, I think that is when it really has a huge epic fail because if they're not engaging, then it's all this stuff behind them about how much they're, you know, nobody likes them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think that at just like anything, when we're doing events or any kind of marketing, that um, there should be a plan. And and you know, if your plan and your speaker is incorporating Twitter into their talk, then it's okay. And I think you know that's something I agree that you can that you can work with. But just to have the events Twitter stream there uh, behind the speaker. Just for random, you know, what's the reason for that? And um, I don't think it's something that um, you have to have for every meeting. And I think that's really the the deal is that everybody's kind of jumping on the social media bandwagon and saying, well, we have to have a Twitter wall, we have to have this, and not necessarily saying, okay, here's how we're going to use it, here's how we're going to incorporate it, and here's why we're deciding. Just like you said at the at the camp that. At event camp, that, okay, we are strategically deciding not to stream live on this day. Whereas somebody else might say, well, no, you need to live stream every single moment of your conference. So, or you, you know, one person will say no paper, and the other one will boo them. But I applauded you earlier. I think I think it really just comes down to people, you know, experimenting a little bit and getting comfortable a little bit. Again, I, I used to. I used to work with a company that had 13 different event modules, 13 different things you could do from marketing to uh, you know, project management to, to uh, connecting with other, to registration, a whole bunch of stuff. And I would say of the 13 modules, maybe three or four of them were regularly purchased and maybe five or six of them were never purchased. You know? So it's really just experimenting with some things. Even the, you know, the Twitter example that I gave, um, you know, they, they, were, they were trying something. And, and they're going to come back and either refine it or not use it. But there's yeah. so much stuff out there that's very exciting. doesn't mean that you have to incorporate all of it. It doesn't mean you have to try it all at once. It doesn't mean that you have to feel you're behind the eight ball if you don't jump in like crazy and, and, and do it all. Yeah, and don't be afraid to fail. Oh, yeah. Well, and I and I'm get oh, I'm just oh. a quick comment to Liz, just real quickly. I know that Liz is probably um, anxious about all this because I I know, and I I mean I think it's I think part of it's generational. I think part of it's style. Um, and I think that this goes, you know, it's what we all keep saying is know your meeting, know your audience, know why. I sure I'll keep hitting the point of why are you doing it. Um, and I think that that's the, that people just don't know. So Liz, um, I, I'm here. Wait one second. Here comes your applause. <laughs> Virtual curtsy. Awesome. So we have somebody in room who wanted to make a comment, and then I wanted to point out some other things, and just for the last couple of minutes, talk about cool things that people are excited about. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. Some of what I wanted to say actually has just been addressed by Joe and, and Jim. But and I blogged about this a while back. You don't use all of this just because it's there. It has to again go back to the purpose of your meeting. Are you using some of the social media to engage your virtual audience purposefully? Is there a plan? You know, we are planners. <laughs> or is it just to say, I've done it, and, and that's not the reason. So everything has to be done purposefully and well planned, and then it'll be successful. Absolutely. Um, did you want something to add to that? Well, are, are we going to get to the topic of engagement, or we don't have time? Um, we've been talking about it right. in oh, okay. different but ways, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, I mean I'm zoning <laughs> yeah, well, what, what I want to say is, in that same vein, Pat, you know, there are different formats to have discussions. It could be a panel, it could be an individual speaker, um, it could be something else more creative. And sometimes people want to try something more creative just because it's creative and it might not necessarily be the proper <laughs> format for the objective, you know? When we talk about getting away from the single speaker that's up there lecturing, sometimes that might be the most intelligent strategy based on what you're trying to communicate, but not enough times do people incorporate the technology with the objective. They just want to go crazy and incorporate it. So um, we have just a few minutes left, so if there's anything that's burning on your mind that you need to ask us, you know, please feel free to do that. I did want to ask Christine, if you wouldn't mind, can you tell us a little bit, uh, I think Evan's got the microphone, can you tell us a little bit about the, she just showed me a, a tool that I think is incredibly useful, especially if you're going on site visits and you need to get a, a feel of the space. 
Um, so share that with us. Um, I don't allow to say now. Can, uh, we can't hear. Uh, we can't hear. Yeah. Can hear now. Sorta. Of. Really well. Go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. Just hold it closer um, to your mouth than you think is comfortable. So I go on a site visit and I found a, an app that's on iPhones and it actually I have one for an iPad too. It's called Magic Plan um, and it uses your camera and kind of maps out the space of the room. You can add doors and windows to it and it's great. It sends you a PDF plan and it works out really well. And now I want an iPad so I can do it that way too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Magic what? Magic Plan. Uh, so, yeah, I actually I downloaded it and I scanned the room and it was really cool. It, you, it, it detects doors and then you push a little button and then it maps the door and it maps the corners of the room. And so it gives you a schematic so you can you know put your tables and you can draw your floor plans and it's really phenomenal. Okay, I have to confess why I'm laughing because um, you know I look at all the things that we've got with the ability of CAD drawing and all this other CAD. So I think um, one day we'll have a way for the hotels to understand good room sets and meeting planners to understand good room sets for gym engagement and for even delivery of a lecture. Um, and one day we'll have those things that we don't have now. So maybe this is a start and we can um, integrate that with Podio and have some fun. Oh. Tell us about Podio. I, I not I can't tell you much. It's what David um, again is the uh, he's teaching it to me because we're using it um, on a project. Um, it is a Google tool. It is free for up to five people. It's like nothing I have ever experienced. I cannot do Excel. I'm embarrassed that I can't. Jim Spellos told me many many years ago it's because I'm too right brained. And um, Podio is a very visual tool. Um, what what David did this year for their national meeting was to integrate tracking his speakers, taking all the speaker bios and putting right into the program from there, all his specs, everything, everything. It is just, it's amazing. And he, this is something he talked about in the industry friends group that he's willing to, you know, he's, we're trying to set up something where he can do um, a webcast, maybe like this, but it's more visual. So we got to figure out how to do that so that he can, um, ex people can experience it. It really, um, it is far better than Excel. It does things that Excel could never, ever do. So, uh, so it's really uh, quick, it looks like it incorporates everything that Google, that you can do on Google. It's kind of a mixture between Drive and Google Plus yes, and yep. Picasso. I mean, it's a project management that uses yes, all of is. your, that, that uses all of your uh, cloud-based services. It's so great. very cool. Does yeah, anyone here cool. have any tools or any like little apps or things like that they find useful? Oh. I don't know why I'm reading Okay, social, social table. Social table. Social table. And what is it? Uh, it's, it allows you to lay out um, room plans. So if you already have a PDF, so say you use Magic Plan and create a PDF of the layout of your space, um, social table literally has every like size table programmed in there. So you can actually, like they already have it measured, so you can place those. And it actually has um, the service perimeter around table, so you realize like you have the two feet around it. And it's been great for me because I lay out a lot of my own spaces, so I can make all the tools already. Yeah, and what it also does is you can import your guest list and seat wow. them. Uh, you can also, it automatically numbers your tables for you, so you just draw a line of how you want the tables to be numbered, and it just and, does that. And, and then how does it. it how does it integrate to um, a facility? In other words, how do you then, how, you just send it to them? What do they get from that? Um, well, so they have a library of facilities that they currently have with their floor plans, and then you can also upload your own. I, I think you, I mean, for me, I just email it to my facilities, like, um, contact, and then they use it to lay out the space once I get there, so is that what you're asking? <laughs> um, yes, I was looking for something more seamless. One of the things that a lot of us um, were frustrated with with in the early days of um, Apex was that we could it wasn't um, being used by the hotels. A lot of these tools are not, so we're dealing with all the different things that we have to have them use, facilities use, in order to make this more seamless in how we plan and operate. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, and uh, as much as I hate to break up a, a fantastic party, <laughs> our time together has has come to an yeah. end. Um, Joan, you did get a shout out from Bern Rex, or he wanted to thank you for bringing up the the closed captioning. Thanks. Um, thank and you. Uh, and so thank you everybody in the virtual audience Thanks. for joining us.
Um, we will be sending out links and related stories and things like that, so follow the Yay PYM hashtag so you can gather that material. If you're watching this video on demand after the broadcast is ended, um, we can't answer your questions in live time, but we can answer them as quickly as possible, so just comment on the video and leave those there. And, uh, yeah, friends, plan Thank well and you. prosper. Thank you. Thank you so much.